Welcome to Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer from the Department of Sociology at Western Michigan University, and I serve as the host for our program. Joining me today is one of our regular Viewmeisters, Felix Brooks. Felix is the Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Kalamazoo Valley Community College and uh, used to moonlight teaching delinquency for me up at Western Michigan University. So Felix, it's just you and me today. Don Cooney is uh, off on assignment, as they say. So um, the critical issues that we thought we would talk about today have to do with, first of all, uh, well, we're coming up on the 100 days of the, of the Trump administration, and uh, lots of uh, critical issues uh, are being raised by the, the Trump administration. And I think that we can definitely take some alternative views on, on some of what's happening with most, Trump. Most definitely. <laughs> So one of the things that, uh, that's been happening uh, is that Trump proposed a budget. Now, I don't think it has much of a chance to actually get passed through Congress, but it is interesting to take a look at the Trump budget because it certainly establishes some of the priorities where he wants to go. Uh, the most distinguishing feature of that budget was, do you remember what the, the military, the $54, million, $54 billion increase in military spending at, while at the same time having an equivalent $54 billion decrease in domestic spending. And some critical programs would definitely be under the axe if that was to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the largest military budget in the world already, uh, equal to uh, the next eight or nine other countries, most of whom are our allies, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you roll the next eight or nine largest military budgets all together, it doesn't come up to where we are already. And now Trump wants to increase that by $54 billion more. And the, and the question is why? Because the supposed threats that are out there to us, you know, Japan, um, China and Russia, militarily, they can't match up to us right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't think this, this, this extra money that, he's gonna, that he wants to put in the military is going is to change that equation one iota. In fact, yeah. if anything, it may, it may act as a destabilizing force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't seem to make any sense from a financial standpoint or even a strategic military standpoint to pump the budget up that much more. You know, and, and, uh, what, and when I was listening to NPR this morning, one of the generals that are interviewing said that we have to prepare for, for wars or conflicts that may not involve soldiers on the battlefield. Mm -hmm, You're mm -hmm. talking cyber, you know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. And that's not what we're talking about th this $54 billion of money going towards. Mm -hmm, you know, it's, right. all, it's conventional. Yeah, it really is. It was a very interesting article on TomDispatch.com. So Tom Engelhart, the editor, runs this wonderful website. So people out there really would like to get some very incisive articles on a wide variety of mostly foreign policy topics. You can't do better than going to TomDispatch.com. And uh, Tom Engelhart has a stable of excellent uh, people who write articles for him. They're usually around eight to mm -hmm. ten pages long. Excellent resource. Well, Michael Clare from Hampshire College in uh, Massachusetts is one of the regulars. Uh, very, very w well regarded scholar on military matters. But he had a very interesting uh, column the other day talking about Trump and Trump's vision of the military. And he said, you know, it almost as if Donald Trump as a young man watched this, uh, this TV documentary called Victory at Sea, which was all about how the US military or the U.S. Navy, in fact, won the Pacific War during World War II and all the great battles and everything that helped turn the tide against the Japanese. And it was uh, uh, widely viewed in the early 1950s, and Donald Trump as a young man might have, might have watched that. But it's almost as if what Donald Trump's vision of the military is based on that World War II kind of almost nostalgia, that uh, here was World War II, we were the good guys, we fought the bad guys, we, had, we ended up having more ships than they did and our ships performed better than them mm -hmm. and look what's happened to our Navy today. Uh, we don't have as many ships as we had you know, 10 years ago and we're gonna build the Navy back up, we're gonna have so many ships, you, know, you mentioned a specific number. And like Michael Clare said, well, what is the strategic purpose of this? I mean. You know, he was speaking at apparently the, the Gerald R. Ford, which is a new aircraft carrier, mm -hmm. which is the 11th aircraft carrier that the U.S. has. By the way, only one other country in the world has two, yeah. and that's Italy. 
<laughs> and, and the Chinese just deployed, I think, their first one today. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so he wants, but he wants a 12th. He wants another one, a 12th one, and he wants to, and Michael Harris said, well, what war is he preparing to fight? I mean, what strategic purpose is it to have more ships and one more carrier when we already have 11 and nobody else in the world has more than, than two? And so it's just sort of let, that that's kind of his, his vision of where, you know, more of a conventional focus, as you yeah. said, fighting the last wars rather than preparing, having a military yeah. prepared which, for the which kinds of issues. Which contradicts his, his other philosophy that seems to run along the same lines, that we're going to be less adventurous in the world, in the rest of the world with respect to foreign policy. So I don't know how you do the, how you reconcile those two things. Yeah. That was before Syria, though, right? I mean, yeah. well, we'll get to Syria in a moment. Let, let's focus on the budget for just a moment, though, because, um, because you know, what's important for people to understand is how much the military budget eats up of the discretionary budget. And uh, so it's important to, to and I, I know we've gone over this before on the program, but I think it's important to, uh, to repeat it, that when we look at the federal budget, there's mandatory spending and then there's discretionary yeah. spending. The mandatory spending is actually the bigger part of the budget. It's about $2.4 trillion is mandatory spending. Now, most of that is Social Security and Medicare. And uh, so again, about 65% of the total federal budget is taken up with this mandatory spending. So those are, those are taxes that are paid out separately from income taxes. So mostly these are the, uh, the federal insurance tax revenue, the withholding taxes and so forth. So that's paid in separately and then that gets paid out separately to people who have invested and, and worked all those years and paid into that fund. On the other hand, we have the discretionary budget. Now this is the budget that Congress actually has the ability to make decisions about where to spend, to prioritize the spending. That's about a little over a trillion dollars uh, in most years. And the military budget eats up the largest proportion of that. And I, I think we have a chart that uh, Dan Smith can put up mm -hmm. for us on the screen here in a minute that, that shows, it's a pie chart, uh, which shows the discretionary spending from 2015. And if you look at that pie chart, there's an awful lot of dark blue, which represents the military spending. And in this pie chart, um, it shows that military spending takes up about 54% of the budget. Now, as a matter of fact, if you add in some other things, interest uh, payments on the U.S. debt, uh, which are in there, I think, someplace, if I remember right, uh, and if you add in also um, the spending for um, veterans affairs, which is related to uh, the military and previous wars, of course. If you add in the Department of Energy budget, which is in there someplace, uh, when you actually calculate all the other things that really relate to current or past military spending, mm -hmm. because the Department of Energy budget, for example, is mostly the nuclear weapons. Yeah. And so it, it actually soars up to about 66% of the discretionary budget. Now look at all the other things that are in that discretionary budget that we have to take care of. Uh, you know, food and agriculture, transportation, science, energy and environment, international affairs, housing, uh, education. I mean, there's just so many other things that are in there that are vital social programs for the most part. And now, so this is the budget that we had in 2015, the discretionary budget. The 2016 pie chart looks almost exactly the same. But now what Donald Trump is proposing is that we increase the blue even more add $54 billion more into a Pentagon budget, which is already over $500 billion. Uh, and when you add in all the military-related spending, it almost comes to about a trillion dollars. Uh, and so nobody else in the world spends that kind of money uh, on their military. No. And so already we spend the most money. We have 700-plus military bases ringing the world. We're the dominant military power. And so why? Why do we need to spend $54 yeah. billion dollars more? Especially, as I said before, at a time when we're, we're supposed to be coming in on ourselves and, and less adventurous in the world, it, it makes no logical sense. And the other piece that makes it difficult is that the sacrifice is going to come from the other programs yeah. at, at the domestic yeah. level, precisely at a time when people in this country 
have been struggling. And, and what they're saying is that, you know, government has forgotten about them. Mm -hmm. Well, his budget doesn't seem to take that into consideration at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, at a time when uh, we are you know, focusing on the, the Trump supporters who may be in some economic distress, mm -hmm. who may rely on certain government programs, most of those programs are now going to end up getting hacked yeah. pretty severely. And uh, so again, it just doesn't seem to, yeah. make, to make a whole lot of sense. They want to, they don't want to increase the deficit. So they're saying this 54 billion increase in the military has got to come out of the hide of all the other programs. Yeah. And so that's going to mean deep, deep cuts for, for that part of uh, the budget. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And if we also just look at the Pentagon budget, we're spending over, you know, the Pentagon budget is going to soar up to around $600 billion per year. And the Pentagon actually has no idea where most of that money goes. No, no the, clue. The, there's tremendous waste and fraud and abuse in the, in the military budget. And they, they can't even account for it. I mean, you think about the hundreds of millions of dollars that, we, that the Pentagon has acknowledged that it's lost both in Iran, I mean, both in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Money they just simply cannot account for. Yeah. And that seems to be the, they seem to accept it as part of doing business. Mm -hmm. But in a budget, in a time when you're gonna be cutting, making major budget cuts, that should not be the case. Yeah, yeah. There was a defense business board that did an, an audit and they found $125 billion of waste and inefficiency in the Pentagon budget. And that was just one small yeah. study looking at it. The Pentagon doesn't regularly do any audits. It actually has no idea yeah. how much money it really has stashed away here and there and uh, how much of that is, is being wasted or spent inefficiently. And because they're in the favor of the president, I don't see that changing in terms of putting any accountabilities and he'll demand accountabilities from all the other domestic programs, but not here. Yeah, yeah. And that's where most of the money is going. So. By the way, it would take, uh, so we, we saw that Pentagon budget of, of 500 to 600 billion dollars and it's actually more than that when we add in the mm -hmm. other military related spending. We should note that it would take about 30 billion dollars a year to end starvation and hunger worldwide. 30 billion. Yeah. So, so not even all yeah. of what Trump's proposing yeah. as an increase. If Trump would say, hey, give me $50 billion and we can eradicate uh, starvation and hunger worldwide, uh, we and could do you, it. And yet we want to cut foreign aid, which, yeah, is, which yeah. is only a minuscule part of the budget. And, and what's really, uh, to me, intriguing about the Trump proposal is that it has drastic cuts for the State Department. Yeah. Huge cuts for the State Department. And in fact, there's a lot of former uh, you know, State Department officials and other military officials who were uh, very concerned about that aspect of, of Trump's proposal. I think they're talking about a 30% cut at the State Department. Yeah, yeah. You know, at a time when you're going to spend all this extra money on the military, I just, I, I, again, those positions don't seem to be able to reconcile themselves because you're taking, out, taking away our ability to do diplomacy. At the same time, you want to build up a, a bigger military, which could potentially wage war with adversaries, and, but you don't want to have a, be able to establish a dialogue, be able to establish a way to talk to these folks. Yeah. You want to, un, yeah. You want to undercut their ability to be able to do that with people with boots on the ground. So makes no sense at all. It makes no sense at all. And we should point out that the State Department budget, the, the amount of money that we have for foreign aid and, and the State Department budget are, are minuscule in comparison to the Pentagon budget to begin with. Yeah. And, and yet now what Trump proposes is to slash those even more, hampering our ability to uh, influence other countries in ways outside of the military force, right? As we found out with this whole North Korea thing, you know, that, that you can rattle the saber all you want to, but at some point in time, people have to sit down and be able to talk. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's, there's, too, there's too much at risk in that. Yeah, and, and, and that, to me, is another problem with the overall Trump approach to foreign policy. It's, it's not only does he want to build up the military and, and make that, in a sense, the, the first option, but it ends up, in a sense, being the only option yeah. in, in many cases yeah. if you drastically cut the other areas. And that presents a major problem because uh, I would argue, and I think a lot, uh, a lot of people who are, have greater expertise on foreign affairs than I, than I do, for sure, would argue that there are no military solutions to most of the problem spots that we find ourselves embroiled in around the world. Especially in the Korean Peninsula, and for that matter, in the Middle East. There, we, we've, we've been watching this scenario play out for the last 50 years, and military options have not seemed to prevail at all. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the folk, the protagonists still have the same position that they had 50 years ago. No matter how, how many often they've, they've used weapons you know, to try to solve that, hasn't worked, mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. not worked. 
yeah, we were going to remake the Middle East with uh, military might. Yeah. With, uh, that was what the invasion of uh, Iraq was all about, right? Yeah. Just to take one big example, uh, we were going to remake the Middle East and democratize it and uh, take out Saddam Hussein and then establish a democratic government and uh, everything was going to be hunky-dory. Everybody else in the Middle East would fall in line. And of course, that did not no, happen. Cl <laughs> clearly, what we've demonstrated since our invasion of Afghanistan, whether we want to admit it or not, you know, from a military and strategic perspective, is that we don't know what we're doing. We have no clue. Yeah. We don't understand the nuances of the parties on the ground well enough to think for a second we could go in there and, and, and impose a democracy. Just, we just don't understand the culture yeah. or the differences yeah. there. And candidate Trump criticized the Iraq war yeah. and said he was against it. Now, they showed with old clips that he was actually supportive of the war when it started, but he claimed that he was against the war and that it was a horrible mistake and he was going to have a different kind of foreign policy. And uh, so, so there was that, that Trump. And then also candidate Trump said about Syria, another hot spot in the Middle East, that Obama should not go into Syria, right? No, and they have, on the, the TV shows, we've seen many clips of him saying, no, 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 don't go into Syria, Obama. It's, you know, it's a horrible thing to do. We'll only get trapped in. Yep. It's a waste of resources. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. He was very emphatic about that. So what's the first great foreign policy uh, 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 move of the Trump administration? The, the 59 missiles that he launched you know, <laughs> to, to, to a base in Syria you know, as a response to their, the use of chemical weapons. And what's lost in that is, you know, with, and all the praise that he received for that was that when, they, when the Syrians deployed chemical weapons on the Obama administration, he went to the Congress to get authorization to use force, and they told him no. Yeah, yeah. We don't think this is yeah. a good idea. And people, have, and people have forgotten that. They act like, like his response was, was, was feckle against the Syrians. But no, he said, I want to go to the Congress and get this authorized. And, you, and they told him no. And now they're praising Trump for going in. He's, he's decisive. Yeah, yeah. We should point out that when Trump launched those Tomahawk cruise missiles, 59 of them, at great cost, millions of dollars wasted there, it really accomplished very little strategically. I mean, it targeted one airfield in Syria, which was back up and running almost the next day, didn't really have any strategic significance at all. And they had uh, ample warning because he, they, they warned the Russians. And so I don't, I'm not under any illusions at all that the Russians did not go to their Syrians counterparts and say, hey, you know, there's attacks coming. Yeah. Just be ready for yeah. it. Yeah. And, then they were, and then they were launching further missions out of that base later that same day yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. So it really accomplished yeah. nothing on the ground no. in terms of any kind of strategic influence. Of course, it was a symbolic message, right? I'm decisive. I'm going to use the military power of the United States, and this is a retaliation for the, the chemical attack. Uh, now, there are just a number of problems. First of all, they didn't really wait to get all the evidence, right? There still are some questions yep. being raised by people who are not conspiracy theorists about what really did happen. I mean, it, it didn't seem to make sense for Assad to use chemical weapons at that particular point. The tide in the war had turned. He was basically yep. in a much more favorable position. There was no military strategic advantage for uh, Assad to use those chemical weapons at that particular point. Uh, and I, it's doubtful that the Russians would have suggested or yep. allowed him to do that at that point if they had any influence on the decision. But if now, you were a group that wanted to tip the scales against Assad, you might have some incentive do something like this, if you, especially if you have access to, the, to that weaponry. Yeah, yeah. So there's some suggestion yeah. that might have come from the rebels. Might have been some suggestion that an errant bomb hit a plant where some of the chemical weapons were stored, which then released them. So it's still not yeah. clear. I mean, so in a sense, what we could say is that we don't really know. Yeah. There should be some investigation. Yeah. But of course, there was no investigation. Everybody jumped to the conclusion yeah. immediately that it was Assad carrying this out. And, and maybe that's true, yes. maybe he did, but we don't really know for sure. And it seems foolhardy to launch a military reprisal strike without having all the facts in hand first. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this is uh, illegal uh, in several senses. First of all, uh, it's, uh, it's unconstitutional, right? Who has the power to wage war? The Congress. The Congress. It's very clear. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution states that Congress has the power to declare war and to raise an army and do yep. a, a variety of other things. Article 1 is very 
uh, detailed in spelling out what the powers of Congress are. Now, did, did Donald Trump go to the Congress and get authorization for this? No. No. Uh, did Obama that. did, yeah. and he didn't get the authorization, did not carry out the strike. Trump ignored Congress completely, violating the Constitution. Now, some might say, well, there's the 2001 authorization to use military force in response to the 9 11 attacks, but how much longer can you use something that occurred, you know, 15 to 16 years ago? Plus, that was geared at threats towards us. Yes. And if you're going to say chemical weapons are a threat, you know, that's, that's your pretext. For, you can go in almost any, uh, any of our adversaries and bomb those places then. If that's, if that's going to be your pretext, that they possess these things, mm -hmm. but that, mm -hmm. you know, that wasn't, they, were, they weren't a threat towards us. No, it wasn't an attack against us. Uh, it wasn't related to the, to the 2001 attack in, uh, uh, in the Pentagon or at the World Trade Center. Uh, and again, uh, that, that authorization has been stretched. Oh. Uh, it's a very elastic authorization. Yeah. It's been stretched beyond recognition to cover a lot of other military misadventures in uh, recent years, uh, including the invasion of Iraq, which yeah. uh, was totally not related to yeah. the 2001 attack anyhow. So you can't in any way, shape, or form say that that authorization to use military force was in effect. So it violated the Constitution. It's a violation. Uh, it's it not covered by the, the authorization to use military force. So again, very clearly a violation of the Constitution for the president to carry out a military action like that, mm -hmm. uh, which is not in defense of the United States uh, and did not get congressional approval or authorization. So it's, it's, it's illegal domestically, unconstitutional. But there's a larger issue, I would argue, in that it's also a violation of the United Nations Charter. Now, the United Nations Charter came into, you know, the United Nations came into existence to prevent future wars. War never again, war never again. The scourge of war needs to be eradicated. And so the UN Charter is very clear. Article 2, Section 4 of the Charter prohibits the use of military force uh, in, in international relations. There are only two exceptions, right? One exception, if you're directly being attacked, yeah. you can respond. And the second is if you have Security Council authorization, right? So if there's a threat to world peace and security, the Security Council can take a number of steps to try to resolve that. If all of those steps fail, then and only then can the Security Council authorize, by all means necessary, the use of military force. That did not happen in this oh, yeah. case either, right? Nor did, nor did Nikki Haley mention that in her speech, you know, yes. where she was, you know, blasting the series. She didn't mention any of the, the, the requisite authorization that, that they needed to be able to do that. She saw, felt all that she talked about is that we will respond. Well, what does that mean, you know? It means the United States responding unilaterally in violation of the charter. I mean, it's why have an ambassador to the United Nations if you're not going to adhere to the, to the, to the rules and regulations? Yes. You're just there as a, as a show of force. Yeah, That's or public relations be, yeah. uh, uh, person, right? Yeah. Now, it's clear that the UN Charter has been violated many, many times yeah. uh, time. since its inception in 1945. But I, I just want to make it clear that the UN Charter does prohibit the use of military force. And if we really are serious in the international political community about ending war or limiting war, the charter needs to be enforced. Now, part of the reason the charter has never been effectively enforced is because of the setup of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. The fact is that the five permanent members of the Security Council all have a veto. And in the past, of course, the old Soviet Union or the United States, today Russia, China, if somebody doesn't like something that's coming to the Security Council, they can veto it, and that ends yep. it. So there's no way to effectively and efficiently enforce uh, Article 2, Section 4 through the Security Council. And so it's been violated tremendously over the years. But the fact is that it shouldn't continue to happen, yep. right? It shouldn't continue to happen. And so I think the Trump administration and the Obama administration violated it yep. as well, the drone attacks. Uh, in the Middle East, also violate uh, in the, Libya as well. So the charter. So, but if we're, you know, what's the purpose of having the United Nations and having the charter, trying to limit wars if all the nations of the world are going to violate it, and there's going to be no one held into account? So, that's a, that's an argument for another day. But I just wanted to point out that right off the bat, these attacks in Syria violated both international mm -hmm. law and the and the U.S. Constitution. Now, what's why the reversal? Why the flip-flop? Because Trump said, no, 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 don't go into Syria, don't do it. And then once this chemical attack occurs, 
boom, and, 59 and missiles are launched. What we know about this president is that he seems to change with the wind. And he seems to be influenced by folks, in this case what they were saying, folks in his own family who showed him the pictures of the, the aftermath of the attack on Syria. And he made a, what I consider a gut level response. It wasn't reason. It wasn't where he met with you know, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and said, you know, this is what we, he, he made up his mind he was going to do. He had to respond. Mm -hmm. And this is from a guy who, who earlier in the week they had said that the administration's line was we're not going to get involved in Syria. We'll let the Syrian people decide what they're going to do you know, yeah. with Assad. Yeah. That, that was from Rex Tillerson. That was a direct quote from Rex Tillerson. And then here we are four days later, we're firing missiles into Syria, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think caught a lot of his own people off guard, mm -hmm. not to mention his supporters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I, I think it's important for uh, when we're talking about Syria or we're talking about the Middle East to get the, the larger picture. And uh, Americans, uh, are not very good at understanding the historical context. We have a tremendous amount of historical amnesia around here. Our political leaders yeah. certainly do. And it doesn't help that the media doesn't provide that historical context. But it really is very important to have that context. One of the reasons, uh, I, if people are interested in uh, what's been happening in the Middle East, I would certainly recommend this book, uh, America's War for the Greater Middle East by uh, Professor Andrew Basevich. Uh, Basevich is a former colonel in the U.S. military. He's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, after uh, serving in Vietnam he, and getting out of the military, he earned a Ph.D. in history, and he's been teaching history at uh, Boston University and has written a series of really outstanding books. And he knows the military inside and out. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's one of our best historians. If you want to have some broader understanding of why the United States is involved in the Middle East, what we're doing there, why it's failed so miserably, you can't do any better than to spend some time reading this book by Andrew Basevich. So I highly recommend this book. Well, let's just take a few of the highlights, Felix. So Basevich would like, I mean, not, not doesn't completely start there, but, but highlights the fact that we, we, you know, the current situation we can trace back to Afghanistan in 1979. But it's important to go back even further than that, right? Yeah, much further. I mean, we go back, if we look at, particularly in the case of Iran, or for that matter, for Iraq, we know that in each one of those countries at one point in time in the early 50s, um, democratically elected governments came into being, only to be overthrown with a combination of, by the combination of the United States and British intelligence which set them, both those countries, on the road to long periods of dictatorship. Mm -hmm. That's how we got the Shah of Iran. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the Iran, Iranians had elected a democratic, democratic um, government, and we overthrew that government, and instead we, we helped install the Shah, which then directly led to the Ayatollahs who came in in 1979. So that, that, that's the history there. Mm -hmm. And it was all due to our our economic interest being having control over those oil fields. We, mm -hmm. we didn't really much care about democracy on the ground then. Right. And most people's history of Iran goes back to 1979. That's what they know. They don't right. know what came before that or why yeah. Yeah. what happened happened before that. Why was the, there the Islamic yep. fundamentalist revolution? Yep. And, it, and it has to do, of course, with the oppression of the Shah, the Shah being in power, as you point out, because of the 1953 coup, uh, which overthrew the democratically elected government. And that was uh, an operation. The Eisenhower administration, the CIA, and the British Intelligence Service carried that and we out. Were, and we were one of the Shah's biggest allies and biggest supporters all, all during this time where he was oppressing his people. That's, this is what they remember, mm -hmm. that the United States supported him. Exactly. In fact, he, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, he came here for medical treatment when he was ill. And that's what probably triggered yep. the takeover of the embassy, yep. the famous takeover of the embassy. So yes, yeah, so that history has to be there. Uh, we could also trace something similar in Iraq, yep. which eventually led to Saddam Hussein, Hussein, who was our guy yep. for a long time. He was our guy, and he was carrying out our bidding. And uh, we, so we had a strong man in Iraq. And also a brutal dictator. Also a brutal dictator. We had the, we had the Shah, and uh, people need to understand that. Now, let's go to Afghanistan, because again, part of the history there is that when the, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in the late 70s, and we were opposed to that, obviously. So what did we do to counter that? We helped to, you know, there was a right-wing Islamic fundamentalist group that mobilized uh, the Mujahideen mm -hmm. to yep. fight against the Soviets. And we egged them on, we funded them, we encouraged them, 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 weapons. 
and, and, we, and we stood back in glee as the Soviets were bled badly in Afghanistan. 20 years. Uh, and eventually had to, were forced to withdraw. Now, out of that Mujahideen came a group called? The Taliban. The Taliban. Another group eventually would be Al-Qaeda. Yeah. So again, what we're looking at is that we saw to, it was to our advantage to use right-wing, conservative, fundamentalist, Islamic groups, who were mostly Sunni, right, to uh, use against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan and uh, to use in Egypt uh, against uh, Nasser and the nationalist yeah. movement there. And so we ended up playing what uh, one author calls the devil's game uh, by supporting these right-wing fundamentalist Islamic groups we set the stage for the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and some of the other And now uh, ISIS groups, as well. And now ISIS. And so, you know, we, we're playing with fire by setting these groups up, and then we're surprised when we get the, they turn around and, and come at us, right? And we get some blowback from that. So it's important to, to note that we supported the Mujahideen in uh, Afghanistan against the Soviets, that we supported uh, the Shah, who was then overthrown by an Islamic yep. fundamentalist revolution in, our, in Iran. So then we turned to Iraq, and at one point we encouraged Iraq to attack Iran, yep. right? So in the 80s there was a brutal war between uh, Iraq and Iran, and we egged on Saddam Hussein uh, in that war. Then when uh, Hussein wasn't doing our bidding and actually went into Kuwait uh, in 1990, then we fought the first Persian Gulf, Persian Gulf, Gulf War and went into Iraq. And, but we didn't take Saddam out at that time, but we drove him out of Kuwait, and, and uh, then we set up the no-fly zones and tried to hem him in. And of course, others, so the neoconservatives in the United States wanted to go back in and do, finish the job, right? George Herbert Walker Bush didn't do it. When George W. Bush came in to office, being selected by the Supreme Court, you should note, uh, and he brought a lot of those neoconservatives into his administration. Uh, from the Project for the New American Century, uh, and he had the hardline nationalists like Cheney and Rumsfeld in there. They decided they were going to go after Saddam Hussein. They needed a pretext to do that, and they got it on? Yeah, it was on November 11th. Or, no, sorry, so yeah. September 11th. September 11th, 2001. It was their godsend to them, in a sense, to get that, uh, that, that they said they needed a, a Pearl Harbor type event. They, they got the it. And so then we have the 2003 invasion of Iraq, which to me is still the greatest foreign policy blunder in the history of the United States. Uh, and uh, again, Saddam Hussein and Iraq had absolutely nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. They were not uh, in cahoots with uh, Al-Qaeda and uh, the, that group. They, uh, uh, they, in fact, they had a, a staunch rivalry against them. And uh, so it didn't make any sense, but they wanted to take out Saddam Hussein, and they thought they could remake the entire yeah. Middle East and turn it democratic. That was the part of the idea, anyhow. Of course, the oil was always a fundamental concern as well, right? If there wasn't a lot of oil in the Middle East, we probably wouldn't have even probably, bothered probably messing around with it to, done to that, begin no. with, right? Yeah. And that, actually, we can all go all the way back to the end of World War II, when FDR uh, met with the Saudi Arabians and basically struck a deal and said, hey, you know, if you continue to allow us to have access to your oil, we'll provide uh, military protection for you over the years. And we, that see how, we see how that's working with our allies, you know, with our allying with Saudi Arabia, but we had no idea or didn't care about what the politics on the ground in those countries were, was going to be like in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. We had mm -hmm. no understanding at all that there was this, there was this ages old rivalry between Sunnis and Shias. We had no clue about any of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so then when there's a, when there's a, when there's civil war going on in Iran, I mean in Iraq, we didn't even recognize it for the first 15 months. We tr in fact, we, tried, we did whatever we could to discredit that whole notion. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, is that um, Saddam Hussein led a Sunni minority government into uh, in the entirety of his dictatorship, and there were a whole lot of old scores to be settled. So once that war unleashed all that and, got, and got Saddam Hussein was out of the way, a lot of those scores were beginning to be settled, and we had no clue because we didn't right. care about the politics on the ground. Yeah, we didn't understand the culture. Yeah. We didn't understand. I mean, I don't think George W. Bush even knew the difference between no. Sunnis and Shias at that point. And of course, the Shias basically take over in Iraq. Yeah. This supports the Shias who are already control Iran. So we actually yeah. strengthened Iran's yeah. hand 
by taking out Saddam Hussein and uh, installing a Shia government. But of course, that created the Sunni resistance, which you know led to the uh, uh, insurgency, uh, which eventually down the road leads to ISIS, yep. right? Uh, and Saudi Arabia, of course, is always looking to back those Sunni fundamentalist groups like Al Qaeda, like ISIS, and so a lot of Sunni money flows in because, again, it. another one of the big rivalries in the Middle East is the Saudi Arabia and Iran, right? So these are the two big regional powers yep. that are kind of duking it out with proxy wars to see who's going to really control the Which Middle what's East. What's going on in Yemen now and what's going on to some extent in Syria as well, so. Yeah, if we're, if we're so upset about uh, uh, Assad, uh, if he, if he in, di in fact did use a chemical attack against his own people and killed a lot of civilians, why aren't we upset about what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen? Yeah. I mean, a lot of innocent people are being killed. A lot of innocent people. Uh, are being killed there. And there are many other instances in the Middle East where uh, civilians have been killed by governments or movements that we support, and we don't say a peep. Yep. But when, uh, and, and I want to make it clear, I consider Assad a war criminal. He's a brutal oh, yeah, he thug, is. he's a dictator, he's a yep. murderer. And uh, so I no sympathy whatsoever for Assad. But nonetheless, when Assad commits a crime, we are then now going to go after him, apparently. But when the Saudis commit crimes, or we ourselves, I mean, how many times have we carried out bombings which have killed innocent civilians? We carried out a bombing raid in, in Afghanistan that killed 24 innocent yeah. civilians just a month ago. And you don't hear anything about that in the I mainstream mean, if press. If you think about it, there were seven countries on President Trump's so-called ban list, but Saudi Arabia wasn't on there, hmm. which is where the, most of the 9-11 hijackers came from. Exactly. So if you're going to think in that sort of insidious way, we're going to ban certain countries from coming to the United States, Saudi Arabia should have been at the top of the list, but Trump's got business interests there. Right. And we have, we have the oil interests there, so, we're not, so we, we just discreetly did not have them on the list, yeah. which made no sense to me at all, yeah. because given the seven countries that are on the list, not a single person from any of those countries have been involved in any terrorist activity in the United States. Not a one. Not a one. None of them were involved in 9-11 yeah. or carried out any uh, attacks since then. So it made no sense at all in a in, from a strategic standpoint to say, we're concerned about terror attacks in yeah. the United States. We're going to ban people coming from these countries. Well, nobody from those countries that carried out any terror attack. Nope. And the ones that they had, as you just mentioned, were the ones that uh, and yeah. were not on the list. So there's, there's a, a, a lot of incoherence here uh, in terms of the, the Trump policies, if there is any policy at all, other than yeah, I who, had his ear, yeah. who had his ear last, yep. right? What pictures did he see last that uh, motivate yep. him to act in, a, in an impulsive way without getting all the evidence, without seeking the advice of his, his people who, are the, who ha should have some expertise yep. about the political and social situation in those countries? And, and the Syrian civil war is, you know, it's a terrible, terrible war that's going on, but it's so terribly complicated as well, because to some extent, ISIS is opposing Assad yep. as one of the rebel groups. So we're opposed to ISIS. We're also opposed to Assad. We'd like to see Assad go away. But if Assad goes away, who takes over in Syria? Will it be ISIS? Uh, so are we trying to pick and choose among the rebel yep. groups? Well, we don't like uh, ISIS, but this rebel group over here will support. Uh, and it just makes no you know, sense. And then whatsoever. you look at the, the Kurdish element. You know, they've been the best fighting force over there, but the Turks don't like that because they're worried about what the, that being a potential threat with their own Kurdish population in Turkey. So you got all this asymmetrical stuff going on. Like again, as I said earlier, so we really don't have any idea what the aftermath will look like, even if our, the forces that we thought we should support won. Yeah. What does that mean 18 months after that? Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how fragmented will it be? Will it be the same thing you, that you have in Libya? Will it be the same thing you have in Iran today? And, I mean, and, Iraq, I should say. And, and just to point out that, you know, by going into Iraq in 2003, we, we not only ended up killing well over a million people. That's been documented yeah. now that the end result was over a million people dying who p wouldn't have died had we not taken, undertaken that. But there were huge refugees. And now, of course, in Syria, we're creating a huge refugee yep. crisis. And so when we talk about refugees and banning people, banning refugees coming or looking at the refugee crisis, people trying to cross the Mediterranean to get to Europe, most of that stems from our active yeah. military involvement yep. exactly. uh, in, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, now involving in Syria and, and in other places. So you've got the refugee crisis to throw in uh, to all of this as well. And uh, it's just a, it's a muddled mess. And I guess. The bottom line for me, I mean, we, we're not going to solve this 
very complicated situation sitting here right now. But one thing I would probably state very strongly is that doesn't appear to be any military solution no. to the situation. No military solution whatsoever. You know, if, at, at, at worst, you may get a stalemate, but it's not going to be. That's not a solution. Right. Right. You know, if you can't get the parties to come to the table at some point in time, and and start sit down and have some constructive conversations, we're going to just be lobbing one weapon after another for the next 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. and, and that to me is not a long-term strategy whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. So there has to be some diplomacy. And the fact that the Russians are in there and they're supporting Assad, uh, and it, it appeared that the Trump administration had a, had a pretty good relationship with Russia at one point. So we've heard, uh, you know. And some connections there. I mean, it would have seemed like a natural thing to say, okay, uh, you know, putting all the other issues about the Russian interference in the election and uh, all that other conflict of interest stuff aside, and that's, that's a very important and critical issue, so let's come back to it at yeah. some point perhaps, if not today on another show, but, but let's just talk about why couldn't Trump and his Russian connections say, let's get serious off. There, and, and, and there were efforts, mm -hmm. I mean, Russia did try after the first chemical attack back in 2013, the Russians came in and brokered some kind of a deal that those chemical weapons were going to be turned over to Turkey and stored in Turkey, right? Mm -hmm. And so it appears that that agreement made some progress, but then fell, fell apart at some point, primarily because we wouldn't support it. Uh, we didn't want Turkey to be involved in it. We want, you know, we want to be able to call the shots. Mm -hmm. That's another problem with our foreign policy. Uh, after all these years, the U.S. Uh, wants to be able to call the shots, and we don't want to have other actors be involved in the situation, which you can't, you, you can't, can't operate because, that way. Because that, that leaves you with what happens afterwards. After you've shown your military might and you, and you retreat to your shores, what happens in the, on, on the ground in those countries afterwards? Mm -hmm. And if we don't have an exit strategy that deals with that sort of thing, then we're, we're going down a rabbit for more, which yeah. is what we've done, which is yeah. what we did in Afghanistan and what we did in Iraq. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and I, I would just, uh, if people are interested, there's a fascinating book by uh, a guy named William Polk. Uh, and it's all about uh, insurgency, and the title of it is Violent Politics. And he takes a very long-term historical perspective. And, and what he documents time and time again is that when, when countries involve themselves in a foreign situation with an occupation or uh, a war, that uh, it almost always generates an insurgency. It always leads to some mm -hmm. form of violent politics. And uh, that, that there are ne never is a, a final military solution to that. That if you, if you occupy, if you wage war, you're always going to generate the, the yeah. blowback, the backlash, the insurgency. And so the bottom line for Polk's, and it's a tremendous analysis of many, many different settings, is that there's no military solution, you know. We and I, and this is where I think we're sort of trapped yeah. in the World War II thing. Yeah. We had victory in Europe. We had victory in the Pacific, right? We had an end to the war. There was victory. We won. It's over, right? That just doesn't happen for the most part. In it's the a much more complicated world we live in now. And and, and in fact, the use of military force usually only makes yeah. things worse. It's not a solution. It makes things worse which means that there has to be diplomacy. There has to be some kind of negotiated settlement to most of these trouble spots in the world. I mean, uh, you figure in World War II, you know, whether folks agree with it or not, the battle lines were clearly about political, different political philosophies. The wars that we're seeing today, nationalism, ideology, religion, don't lend themselves really well to military solutions, because mm -hmm. this is about what people fundamentally believe about themselves and their place in the world. And that actually, that doesn't tend to lend itself to, to a military solution, because you're not going to change the way people believe. Mm -hmm. Whereas World War II was fundamentally different in that respect. Yeah, yeah. So again, if people are interested, I highly recommend William Polk's book on violent politics. And again, there is no military solution. There has to be the diplomatic solution. By the way, the work of Robert Pape, a political scientist at the University of Chicago, was also very instructive because he has analyzed all the major suicide terrorist attacks in the world. He's got a tremendous database over there at the University of Chicago. His major point is that what causes suicide terrorism is occupation, foreign occupation. In almost every single circumstance, it's foreign occupation 
that leads to, again, the insurgency, the terrorists. The insurgencies are called terrorists, yeah. right? If you're, if you're resisting the occupation and resisting the military intervention, you become a terrorist, right? And, and then you're responded to with more military force, which then only uh, intensifies the insurgency, right? And so there, it's a no-win situation. And so if we want to stop terrorism, you have to stop committing state terrorism yeah. in the form of occupations yeah. and yeah. interventions. And again, this is where the call for the United Nations to be strengthened, for the Security Council to really do its job, to really enforce Article 2, Section 4, for the nations of the world to really be serious about engaging in diplomatic negotiations to end these or resolve these trouble spots. Uh, but that's not the route that uh, we're taking, and it doesn't appear to be the route well, that the Trump administration... And I think a lot of it that has to do with, the, with our own experiences compared to many of the other countries in the world, we have not experienced what it's like to be occupied by another. So we don't have that institutional memory whatsoever. Right, right. It doesn't, just doesn't exist. We don't, Americans mm -hmm. don't even think about it in those terms. Whereas if, you're, if you grew up in London during World War I, World War II, you understand that. If you grew up anywhere in the Middle East or Germany or whatever, you understand what it means to have your country occupied or Russia. They know what it means to have, be occupied by another power. We don't have that. Right, right. So we right. continue to operate out of this, this notion that we're somehow immune to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And we're not, and we're not have to deal with the same sort of blowback. But over there, they have to. Yeah. There's consequences yeah. when you go into a country, you know, both at the time you go in there and once you leave. Mm -hmm. And we don't seem to have a really good understanding of the politics on the ground, nor do we seem to want to. Right. You know? and, and this predates Trump. Yeah. yeah. This, this, yeah. I mean, what we're talking about is well before Trump. This is U.S. foreign policy since historically. Since World War II, yeah. Since World War II. But now, okay, given that background, that historical context, now we have a man who's president who doesn't really seem to understand any of that context. No doesn't seem to have any ability to rationally sort out and analyze the situation, doesn't seem to have people around him who can carry that out, and, and it operates rather impulsively. Short-term thinking. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th I, I think we've already got a dangerous situation made even more dangerous by the current president of the United States. What about North Korea? Let's what do we, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but let's just talk about North Korea because here's another spot where Trump seems to be reacting rather impulsively uh, with a, a very complicated situation, thinking more lines that, along the lines of perhaps there's some military solution to this. So the criticism of the Obama administration is, and to some extent the Bush administration before that was that they spent far too much time trying to pacify the North Koreans. But what, those, what both Bush and Obama understood was Let's, th let's take a look at a map. Seoul, South Korea is about, what, 45 miles from the North Korea border, 25 million people there. We do anything at all, wh where are the North, Co North, um, Viet North um, Koreans going to turn their, face, their eyes to? It's South Korea. Yeah. That's where they they're going to launch their attack. There. That's, there's yeah. nothing we could do. There's nothing we could do. If we undertook some kind of a, a military attack in North Korea, they could demolish Seoul in a, in a matter of days. And so however boisterous we want to be, the military has always known if you flip over this domino, this is where this is going to go. No one argues that point at all. Even the folks that are, who, are, who have been bombastic about what, the, what Trump has done now, they understand. There's a reason those 59 missiles got launched into Syria and not into North Korea. Because everybody understands that if we play that game, there's going to be a proportionate, or I should say a disproportionate military response. And who is that response going to fall on? The South Koreans. Mm -hmm. And then what are we going to say? Yeah. Oh, we didn't see this coming? We had no idea? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we're talking a really good game, but I think the reality is going to be there's not a whole lot we can do if we don't sit down and negotiate with the North Koreans. And it's not like the leadership in North Korea is all that stable no. uh, to begin with itself. Which sort of makes things worse. It's, it's even more of a wild card. Right, yeah. right. They have a leader in some respects who's a lot like our leader in terms of, in terms of being impulsive and you know, who will respond to something on a whim, something that's, that appears in the newspaper or some provocation that he sees that, you know, that he thinks is a danger to his country, he's going to respond to it. Yeah. You know, basically what he said to the Trump administration is, bring it on. Yeah, yeah. Because he knows he's got the Trump card. Yeah. He, can, uh, he can attack South Korea. He doesn't have anything that could yeah. reach the United States. And nothing to lose. Uh, but nothing to lose. Uh, and so, I mean, the only reason he has developed nuclear weapons in the first place is as, as a deterrent, right? Yeah. Because he doesn't want to get attacked again. Uh, and so, uh, I don't think, I mean, you know, he, 
Kim Jong-un might be crazy, but he's not crazy enough to think that even if he does develop a, a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach the west coast of the United States, what does he have to gain by launching yeah. that weapon? I mean, um, absolutely nothing to gain from doing that, and of course he would be obliterated if he, if he tried to do that, right? So he's crazy, but he's not that crazy. No. He's not suicidal, I don't think. And so, uh, again, but possessing those weapons gives him a trump card and uh, gives him a negotiating yeah. uh, device, right? Now, to me, the key here is China, right? And it seems that maybe Trump is slowly coming to that realization that the only way to resolve or pacify the danger zone in, in Korea is with the Chinese involved. Yeah. And that's why they're no longer a currency manipulator. <laughs> you know, that was, you know, the little pat on the back, you know, we'll take that off the table now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So uh, it would seem that here's another situation where the belligerent rhetoric that's coming from the Trump administration, and who knows what's happening, because as we're taping this program, all 100 senators have been called to the White House compound to have a briefing about North Korea. So who knows what's yeah. being, you know, being discussed there. Uh, I think we can all hope and pray that they're not talking about some kind of military strike. It's, to me, the only solution is that you know, you've got to have patience, you've yeah. got to have a uh, strategic uh, initiative uh, underway. Uh, you can't uh, provoke North Korea with rhetoric. You can't threaten them uh, by sending an armada. You got to know what direction to send your armada, right? In the first Didn't place. the Spaniards used to send out armadas? <laughs> I don't. I didn't. Know. I think I they sent them in the right direction, yeah. though, right? I didn't know. Yeah, Trump, I didn't know the Trump sent States his in the that, wrong yeah. direction, or somehow. But but again, it, the Chinese are the key here. Yeah. The U.S. and China have to uh, get together. The Chinese have to be significantly involved. North Korea is on their border. It's one of their client states. They don't want trouble. Uh, on that peninsula. They would like things to calm down. It's to their advantage for that to happen. And so a little bit of patient negotiating uh, involving the Chinese would probably be the best way. You're never going to resolve it completely. Uh, the North Koreans aren't going to give up their nuclear weapons no, now that they happen. have them. Uh, but you can certainly calm down the tensions and ease the concerns that are going and on. And they right have now. to be a play there because I don't think that the Trump administration should be under no illusion at all that the Chinese are going to accept military, American military boots on the ground in North Korea. That's yeah. unacceptable. Yeah. That will not happen. That will not no. happen. And, and just one final thing. We were, I just have about five minutes left, and I want to get to another issue here. But the, the uh, hypocrisy. I mean, the United States has nuclear weapons. Yep. It, uh, it modernizes its weapons. It says it needs them for its defense. But if North Korea develops a weapon, they can't do that. Uh, yeah, right? I mean, it's hypocritical. And, and, and I have 100 guns and you have one. Uh, you can't have that one gun, Felix. I have 100, you, but you can't have one. And they used the UN Charter to invoke that position. That's the part that, that's yeah. hypocritical to me. Yeah. On the one hand, you, you delegitimize the United Nations, but you're going to use that charter to say, to deny North Korea the ability to have these weapons. Yeah, yeah. Those treaties, so. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, let me stop at this point uh, with our show today because uh, this is the last program that uh, Mr. Felix Brooks is going to be involved with Critical Issues Alternative Use. Uh, unfortunately for us, fortunately for him, uh, he's retiring and moving down to uh, Wilmington, Wilmington, North, North Carolina. Carolina. So yeah. what are you going to do down in Wilmington? For the first six months, I'm just going to sort of hang out with my dog and my wife and sort of, you know, cool my jets for a while. But I'm, I, I, don't, I won't stay on the sidelines too, for, for too long. But I just want to get a, get a uh, look at the lay of the land and get used to my new home and by the ocean and go for a few long walks and contemplate, you know, the politics of North Carolina, which is a different state in and of itself. So yeah, yeah. there'll be some places for me to dip my toe in the water when I'm down there. But I just wanted to, you know, let you know that I appreciated the opportunity to come on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed it, mm -hmm. you know, talking mm -hmm. about these issues, because this goes back to the initial time I sat in your classroom way back in the 1970s. So <laughs> this sort of, in some, in some respects, sort of closes the circle. Yeah, know? yeah. So Felix is probably one of my longest, oldest friends in Kalamazoo. Yeah. Because when I first arrived in Kalamazoo in 1978, and I, st I started teaching criminal justice criminology courses, you were a student, I think, yeah, in that very first, first class. Course yeah. that I taught. So I've known you longer than almost anybody else uh, in Kalamazoo. And uh, we were neighbors at a time yeah. at Candlewick. And uh, of course, you went on, after graduating from Western, you went on to work at the uh, juvenile court. 
you were an outstanding probation officer for many, many years, and you uh, carried out a number of different programs for, for them. Uh, you worked for the Kalamazoo Foundation for a while once you retired from the juvenile court. Uh, you ended up out at uh, Kalamazoo Valley Community College doing an excellent job as their uh, officer of diversity and inclusion. Um, along the way, uh, you have also been involved in a number of other projects in the community. Uh, you taught for us for many, many years. You taught juvenile delinquency uh, in the criminal justice program in the Department of Sociology at Western Michigan University. You did an outstanding job. You always got great ratings from your students. So we're going to miss you there, too, because you, miss you, all that as well, you, so. you fulfilled a very valuable function in teaching that course for us. And, uh, of course, then coming on to critical issues. Now, we had you on a, a couple of times as a guest. Yeah. And then uh, when Lynn Bartley decided he was going to step down, we needed uh, to uh, fill uh, that role. We needed somebody else to come on to be on the program. And so you were the first person that Don and I thought about inviting to join us. And we're so glad that you did and grateful for all the wonderful work you've done on critical issues over the years. And we wish you the best of luck going down to, uh, to Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, you know, like I said, if you're ever down there, stop in and see me. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to practice retirement for about six months, and then we'll see, what <laughs> we'll see what happens after that. See if you, I hope you don't fail at retirement. Yeah, yeah I hope I don't fail at it, yeah. And, and I've been joking with Felix that he has to fly back every month to do critical issues, but, uh, but of course he's not going to do that. So, Felix, again, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank You've you. been a wonderful friend and colleague, and, and it's been great to have you on the program, and, and good luck to you and Carol down in North Carolina. Well, and we will miss you very much. And in I'll this definitely community. be watching the show. And we'll definitely miss you on this program. Yeah, so, thanks. Well, uh, that wraps up another issue of Critical Issues Alternative Views. Uh, we invite you to come back and join us again very soon. And uh, with that, we'll say uh, goodbye and, and good luck to Mr. Felix Brooks heading off to North Carolina. Thank you for joining us.